Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit LiveTalksLA.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. We welcome Robbie Krieger and Jeff Alulis to Live Talks Los Angeles. They'll discuss Robbie Krieger's memoir, Set the Night on Fire, Living, Dying, and Playing Guitar with the Doors. Krieger is the guitarist for the legendary rock band The Doors and the songwriter behind some of the band's biggest hits, including Love Me Two Times, Touch Me, Love Her Madly, and their number one smash, Light My Fire. Jeff Alulis is the co-author of Robbie Krieger's memoir. He's also the co-author of the New York Times bestseller, NOFX, The Hepatitis Bathtub, and other stories. He has directed several award-winning music-based documentaries, and he has toured as the vocalist for seminal punk bands, Dead Kennedys and Reagan Youth. They will talk and include some questions sent in from you in the audience. I'll let you take it from here, Jeff. How you doing, Robbie? Hi. Nice. To, <laughs> it's nice to meet you after uh, spending several years with you. Uh, this is this has got to feel familiar. You and me sitting together and me asking you a million questions about your life. We've been doing that for the past couple of years now, and now the book is it's all finished, and here we are. I'm still asking you a million questions and sitting down with you. Have you gotten sick of me yet? Are we? Yeah, well, I'll let you know. After yeah, this. please. Okay. <laughs> I still I still enjoy hanging out and talking with Robbie Krieger. It's still fun for me. Um, but the, the, so the one question I haven't really uh, dived too deeply into uh, in the course of working on this book is what's it like to work on the book? You know, what, what, how has this process been for you? And, uh, you know, was it more work than you expected? Was it rewarding? Would you do it all over again? Tell me about what it was to, to work on your book. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, I, I really started this process like years ago, 25 years ago maybe. Um, and at, right at that point, you know, John's book had come out and Ray's book had come out, and they, nothing but trouble happened because of those things, right? So I kind of put off the idea, kept putting it off, I add a little here and there, but, uh, but when I met you, we were doing a different project, a possible film about the uh, early days of the doors. Um, you. You, just, you talked about, uh, hey, where, why don't you have a book out? And, and so um, I had to say, and then the pandemic hit, and then we said, hey, let's, okay, let's do this. Let's get this done, you know? And he really helped me. I mean, he, uh, I couldn't have, uh, wouldn't have happened without Jeff, so. I'll let him know, thank you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the pandemic, it was a nice time to have no distractions, to be able to actually sit and get a lot of work done. So, yeah, yeah. work out in some ways, there's silver linings. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, I, I've noticed there's a lot of uh, books coming out right now. Yeah, everybody. And, and, you know, videos and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I miss playing live, but I hope that'll happen again soon. Yeah. Well, the, uh, so I do have to, I, I want to commend you also. Um, in the course of doing this book, you were extremely open about a lot of stuff. There's a lot of difficult subjects in this book. Um, you know, you talk about your history with drug addiction, your brother's mental illness, your wife's miscarriage, uh, you know, Ray Manzarek passing away, uh, your own battle with cancer, STDs, everything. You, you, and uh, I, I got to commend you that, you know, I never felt like your foot was on the brake. You were just very ready to talk and ready to be open about this stuff. And I think that that always makes for the best memoirs. So was that something you kind of went into it with that idea or how did that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I thought about it and, uh, you know, after reading some of the other books out there, um, uh, rock and roll guys, um, none of them really went into like, you know, any of the deep, cuts you know of their lives that much and so I said well 
you know what, this book is going to be really boring unless I really t tell the whole thing, you know. And uh, I think it worked. I, I definitely agree. I, I always think the more honest, you know, the better. And I th you know, like yeah. I said, I just never felt like you held back. Uh, was it tough to talk about those subjects or is it, have you kind of, did you have enough distance where you were comfortable about it? Was it difficult at all? It, was, it wasn't easy, but, okay. uh, you know, uh, I think enough time has passed now since those things have happened that uh, I'm, I can see that some good will come out of it. Maybe some people will read and say, okay, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> right. Learn from your mistakes. Yeah, yeah, as I failed to do from Jim's mistake. <laughs> right. Um, well, so one of the stories that I'm excited for that will finally be published officially is the story about your black eye. And for fans who, who don't know, The Doors appeared on the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. Robbie Krieger, some people have noticed, had a black eye in the background. And so I don't want to give any spoilers away or tell, talk about what happened. No. Check out the book. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a crazy epic tale. Uh, but I'm just curious about, you said that that was the most common question you get, is that right? Pretty much, yeah. People always think, oh, I'm going to ask him about that black eye, because nobody would ever ask him about that. <laughs> but it turns out that, that that's the most asked uh, question I get. Crazy. And how did you keep it uh, to yourself all these years? Well, I just kept inventing new stories about it, you know, and... and uh, I never really told the truth about it until the book. Right. Is there, uh, so again, we'll save the, the secret for the actual book. Are there other, so that's one that I'm excited. Are there other stories in the book, you know, now that this is coming out, there's a lot of stuff that hasn't been told. Anything that you're excited to see the reaction to uh, from fans or from pe people in general? What, uh, what are you excited to put on record finally? Oh, gosh, um, uh, you know, what really, how it really went down in Miami, uh, and uh, in New Haven, among others, um, and uh, you know, I don't know if people really know much about our uh, early show that we did a, a, at the uh, college at um, where was that one? UCLA. No, uh, it's the one where Iggy Pop was. Oh right, University of Michigan. Michigan. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff I think that people won't have heard about as well as, you know, the obvious stuff that's been in the movie and this and that. And so I wanted, wanted to give my own account of those things to, you know, straighten out the real truth from what you may have heard in movies or other books. There's a million sides to every story. I'm, it's, uh, it's, I, I definitely felt privileged to be able to sit down and I, there was multiple times like working on these stories where I would be like, oh wow, really? Like just a whole new wave, even if it wasn't a big revelation, just seeing your angle on it and your opinion was always so cool. So yeah, I'm excited to see it too. Um, so Jim Morrison, he's a person that comes up occasionally in this book about the doors. Uh, the one of the, so the, the beauty of me getting to sit here and interview you is I know all the stuff that we didn't get to, we couldn't fit in the book, all these little small anecdotes. Uh, so this is uh, yeah, one of many. Have, we had like 600 pages or something. Yeah, it's, and, uh, well now I think the book is a little over 400 now, which is yeah, so, it's so. Just, just as thick as Ray's book. I think that was the goal, right? We wanted to make <laughs> sure we didn't get one page more or less. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, so there was a story that you told. It's just a small little thing, but um, about how, I think it was maybe when you first were in the band, Jim was showing you pictures that he had taken, sort of where he was kind of posing and modeling. What was the exact story there? Well, it, it was later. It wasn't when I was first in the band. It was, uh, geez, maybe around Morrison Hotel album time, 1969, 70. And I don't know why or wh why he did this, but he, he's, all of a sudden he pulled out these old photos of himself. Uh, maybe his sister had sent them or something. And uh, he... And you could see that he was really playing to the camera in, in these shots. Even though he was like, he didn't look like the Jim Morrison we know. He was like kind of pudgy and fat little kid, you know. And he goes, you see this? I, I knew even back then that I, that I wanted to, you know, play to the camera or, or some words, some kind of words like that. Hmm. And it, it was uh, pretty revealing. I, I never... I never realized he was that, you know, into it at that age. Um, 
because he didn't act like that at first. You know, when we were first playing shows, he was like shy, very shy on stage and uh, didn't even want to face the audience sometimes. Hmm. Is it, and you sort of, you described it, if I remember right, he was kind of like trying to go for a Marlon Brando thing. Like, what was he looking like in these photos? Yeah, exactly. Uh, James Dean, maybe. Um, he just had that, that look, you know, which wasn't quite making it <laughs> because he was so kind of pudgy. Right. The, uh, but yeah, it's just fascinating to me again to think about <clears throat> how conscious he was of imagery and think like even at that young age. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I knew he had, he had uh, written some amazing poetry at that age, but uh, I didn't realize that he was, had any desire to be like a movie star or a pop star. Right. Um, I don't think he ever imagined himself to be a rock star. Sure. He, uh, well, so also like the first, the first album, the first cover, uh, he appears very big, you guys are a little small. Did you guys know that that was coming out and how did Jim feel? Was he self-conscious? Was he, how did he feel about it, I guess? When yeah, it... he was, he was. He didn't really like it, you know, he, uh, although it looked so good. Yeah. <laughs> he couldn't really say, say much to that. But, uh, yeah, in fact, he, uh, he, he did complain about it and uh, we all talked him into it, you know. But if you notice on the next album cover, there's nobody on the front. You know, we're all equal on the back, equal size on the back. So. Uh, and that yeah. was at his. Did he sort of yeah, he, share he, that? He, yeah. He, you know, he didn't want to be the the star of the band. You know, he he wanted to be a real band, like uh, the Beatles. You know, mm -hmm. and he, you know, he and a lot of times people would say Jim Morrison and the Doors, and he would correct them and say, no, it's the doors. <laughs> it's not Jim Morrison and the doors. Gotcha. This is, um, so one of the experiences that I've had, and again, that I hope other fans have when they read the book is, you know, for instance, hearing a story about the album cover, it's like, and then I go back and I look at the album cover and now I see it in a, a whole new way. I think I see you guys having this discussion about and him being self-conscious instead of, you know, uh, yeah. so there's a million examples of that. Uh, this is something I'm sure maybe hardcore fans know about this, but your tie on that first album cover is a little Easter egg, right? Can you tell me about the, the tie on the album cover? That, that tie, it's like blue with polka dots. Or is it black with blue polka dots? No, it's black blue. With something. I think it's blue with white polka dots. Yeah. Anyway, that, that was an, the exact tie that Miles Davis wore on uh, his album, my Funny Valentine album. Right. So uh, that was just... Uh, I love it, yeah. yeah. But again, I, mean, I never noticed that tie o o over so many years, and then really? finally you, you told never me, that tie? no, I mean, and, and then I who's who's so looking cool. at the tiny little? It's so small though. It's just so. <laughs> and then you told me that story. I was like, oh, look at that. Yeah, it's totally right. So um, and so yeah. Some more speaking of imagery stuff. Uh, one of you know there is of course the classic picture of Jim Morrison is the young lion photo, shirtless Jim Morrison, arms outstretched with his. You know, you say Jim Morrison, that's the picture that pops into people's heads. And that was done by Joel Brodsky, right? Yeah. Uh, so the thing is, you guys were, it's been depicted in the movies and people know that image. You guys were all in the room, right, when that picture was taken. Can you take me to that, uh, the photo session when that photo was taken? Well, it was uh, in New York at Joel Brodsky's studio. I had a big old studio. And um, at first, Jim was kind of shy, to, you know, wasn't doing nothing. But few beers, few wines later, he kind of, I think in his, his mind, he knew what he wanted to uh, project, mm -hmm. you know, and I think, I think Joel helped him quite a bit, but uh, it was, uh, it wasn't just by accident. Right. Was it, did Joel, did he have the shirt off from the beginning or was no. it after a couple beers, the shirt came off? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And then when you guys first, now was was he, were you guys kind of letting him roll with it or were you guys kind of embarrassed of, oh, Jim, like, you know, put your shirt back on or what was going no, on? No, it was cool. It was, uh, you know, totally what we uh, expected at a right. photo se session with Jim Morris <laughs> right. at that time. Yeah, but That I, was pretty early on, too. That was before the first album came out. Yeah, I think it was right, yeah, there at, right after maybe. I think what it was really for was... Uh, a magazine cover 
No, no. That's I think it was sorry. for a, if I have it right, and the fans will crucify me, of course, but I believe it was like a publicity shot because I think the, because you guys were wearing the black smocks, right? To right, where your heads right. were just going to be yeah, visible. So I think, right. and I know that came out in the, an insert in Strange Days or something. Right. I don't know, but yeah. We tried to track it down. It was a, it's a tough one to nail down exactly. Well, I know we didn't pay for it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't was not cheap. Right. Um, the other thing that's fascinating to me uh, is that, you, you know, you kind of mentioned this in the book, like Jim, like that image of Jim with uh, no shirt on, uh, is so iconic, and that's sort of the thing that everybody thinks of with Jim Morrison. But he really only looked like that for maybe two or three years of his life, right? And then he, the beard came in, he started gaining weight, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like I said, when he was a kid, he was kind of pudgy and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it was just uh, what it was, I believe, was the right combination of drugs. <laughs> I don't think he tried to do that uh, you know I think it was it was just meant to be you know he was taking acid at the time and when you're taking a lot of acid you don't eat hardly at all right and uh, he lost just the right amount of weight at that time you know that's that's why I always say doors were there at the right place at the right time <laughs> <laughs> otherwise yes he wouldn't have been as skinny later on yeah, yeah. The, uh, I was speaking with your manager, Jeffrey Jampol, and uh, he has an old contact sheet from that, the original contact sheet from that uh, photo session. Um, and it's got Jim Morrison's markings on it. I guess you guys would have seen the, the photos and said, okay, this one, this one. And it's like on that famous photo, there's just a tiny little check. And I, I love looking at that because I'm like, there's just no way when you make that check mark that you think about 50 years later that <laughs> that thing is on the sides of buildings and album covers and t-shirts and... I mean, I can't even comprehend how enormous that image is. And you guys saw it and just were like, oh, that's a nice photo. Like, what was <laughs> yeah, the... I don't... Uh, I wonder who made that check. Yeah. Was it Bill Harvey? Was it Steve, uh, the publicity guy? I don't know. Uh, or was it Jim? Do you guys remember seeing the photo sort of for the first time and going, oh, that's nice, or... Um, I, I thought it was a little excessive when okay. I first saw it. <laughs> but... Uh, they didn't hesitate to use it. All right. I see. It's a good, are you glad they didn't listen to you? You would have been, oh, yeah. no. I wonder what Jim thought. Because, you know, he was always the one that wanted us all to be kind of equal. And, mm. But maybe in his deepest mind, he didn't really want us to be right. all equal. You know? He never said, I look sexy there, guys. Like, come on. <laughs> all right. wasn't necessary. If he had had a shirt on, how different would your life have been? I don't, who knows? <laughs> uh, so... Um, also in the book, obviously, we talk a lot about, you know, your influences and uh, the flamenco artists, jug band artists, uh, folk. You, 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 you had them all in a, one big stew, I guess. We have a great story about you meeting Willie Dixon. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, meeting Albert... Oh, sorry, who, would, who were we just talking about that, you, that taught you about the thick Al guitar strings? Al Albert King? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I used to go see him. Um, yeah, and on Melrose at the, uh, what's the house the name that place? Uh, da, 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 da. On Melrose, but yeah. Anyway, there was a, a folk club mm. on Melrose, and it was, uh, you know, I, we used to go every week because they would have somebody cool there every week. Mm. And um, Albert King came. I didn't really know who he was that much. Um, you know, I heard Born Under Bad Sign, whatever. But uh, didn't know much about him, so we went. Uh, he, I think we went every night that he was there, and kind of got to hang out with him a little bit. And uh, I said, "Man, how do you, how do you bend those notes so much and and uh, without uh, breaking the strings?" You know, and he goes, "Well, I use really heavy strings. Really, damn." Uh, but I tuned the guitar down, like four steps down. So uh, that made sense, you know. I tried it. I didn't. I couldn't do it. I, I just. Uh, I couldn't do it. Too thick to play. Well, he's got these hands like the size of hams. You know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but uh, I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, yeah, there's there was. Uh, it was really cool to be able to hang out with guys like Albert King, B.B. King, yeah, and uh, Freddie King, 
We're all the kings. <laughs> you had a, well, I love, there's a story that you told me about that you guys went to, see, you, you used to go see B.B. King, was it at Gazari's, or where did you go see him? Right. Uh, yeah, Gazari's was a place right down from the whiskey. Mm -hmm. And so on Sunday afternoons, they would have B.B. King, because people didn't really know about him that much at that time. So, uh, you know, we go in there late afternoon, and it's just him and a, and a Hammond player. You know, so the Hammond guy played the bass. I forget if there was a drummer or not. But uh, it was pretty amazing, just the four of us doors and B.B. King playing <laughs> to no audience. It was just... <laughs> that just blows me away, yeah. Just B.B. King playing and then just the audience empty except for the doors, like all four doors. Yeah. That's crazy yeah. to me. I wish we had a picture of that. If only, yeah. Who, who would have thought? So this would have been what, like whiskey days, fog yeah. days? Yeah, Six, so 1967, 66. So early on. Yeah. Um, also, uh, let's see. Uh, well, I also want to talk about your... Oh, and West Montgomery, too. So you famously play without a pick, usually. Right. Uh, but then it was there was a story with West Montgomery that made you maybe reconsider that? Yeah. Well, if you look at his thumb, his thumb is like... it's He actually uses his thumb like a pick. Mm -hmm. And it just it looks like a piece of raw meat, you know, it's like... <laughs> and then I, I read this article by him later, and uh, he, they said, well, why didn't you use a pick? And he goes, well, I wish I would have. I wish I would have, you know, if I'd known now, you know. Right. And uh, although it sounded pretty damn good without a pick. Um, and at that point, I, I started to learn to use a pick. That, that was maybe 75 or something like that. Okay. Thumbs are doing okay now, yeah. yeah. You saved just in time. <laughs> the, uh... yeah. But, you know, he, he was famous for the octaves, mm -hmm. and with, he did that with his thumb. You know, most guys will use either a pick or other pluck it with their fingers. Mm -hmm. But uh, he had that, oh, the whole that thing. thumb that was like a club. Okay. Amazing. Uh, and then, so in terms of more rock and roll influence, one that we, I don't know that we got enough uh, spotlight on this, but uh, Dick Dale, you used to, didn't you go, you used to go see him all the time as well when you were younger? Yeah, yeah when I was a, uh, a teenager, mm -hmm. the hot place to go to pick up girls and stuff was the Rendezvous Ballroom in Newport Beach. So Dick Dale would be there a lot. And uh, I never, never got to meet him or anything. But uh, I just loved his his sound, you know, the the uh, tremolo and, and the big. Now he's a guy that used heavy strings mm -hmm. to get it almost sound like a bass, you know. And um, and then years later, um, I I got to be on a few shows with him, you know, Robbie Krieger band with and Dick Dale and a couple other people, who knows. So I I got to talking with him and and. Uh, you know, asked him all about all his guitars and stuff. And then he, he said, I said, where do you live? And he goes, Palm Springs. He goes, why don't you come on out, you know, one weekend. Or, and um, I said, yeah, that sounds cool. Said, you got a studio there? Can we jam? He said, no, man, we fly airplanes. Really? Yeah. So apparently he's he was one of these guys that likes to do stunt piloting. Okay. And I said, I'll, w I'll wait on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Self, -pre yeah, preservation instinct kicked in? Yeah. Oh, you never got to fly planes with Dick Dale, though. It would have been a story. I, that was stupid. I should See, then it would have made the book if we had, if you had flown planes with Dick right. Dale. Um, and also, uh, you got to meet, uh, well, you, we, Ravi Shankar was a big influence, and you got to, you and John actually went to his music school, right? Right, right. Um, it was called the um, Kinara. Kenara School, mm -hmm. and it was down in Hollywood. And um, John learned it, was learning the tablas, and there was this. Uh, I think uh, I think it was Robbie's uh, one of Robbie's guys that taught, and then the, um, the other guy was uh, Hari Haura Haurau. I don't know how to pronounce it, but he was the sitar guy. And uh, that was pretty cool just to go to that school. And then Robbie showed up one time, and uh, we all got to talk to him and stuff. And 
What did it, so what did Ravi Shankar? So, so what was Ravi his says, so listen, if you really want to be good at, you know, at your instrument, you have to lay off sex. <laughs> at least for, you know, sure. a reasonable amount of time. And then I learned later that he was like one, one didn't really didn't follow his own advice. Now, if I remember right, did you say something that like Jim said sort of the same thing during the first album? Like when you're recording the first album, nobody have sex or something? Yeah, yeah, Jim said that. Right. It was our first, uh, uh, first day in the studio, and the night before he called everybody and just, nobody have sex tonight, save it for tomorrow, you know. And did, do you think he followed uh, his own advice? I uh, highly doubt it. Right. It's, yeah. anytime, I, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> anytime a, a guy tells another group of guys don't have sex, it's uh, there's a highly suspect. They're probably hogging it for themselves. They just want to <laughs> don't want the competition, right? Right. Um, and let's see. You also uh, there was another story. You know, it's a little thing, but uh, you and Jim got to go to one of Timothy Leary's uh, early lectures, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, it wasn't early. He was pretty famous okay, by then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he had a deal at the San Monica Civic Auditorium, and uh, it was like kind of a human being type of thing, you know. And uh, I forget what he was. I mean, he was talking about acid, obviously. But uh, Jim and I managed to warm ourselves up to, onto the stage, and kind of sitting hmm. as his feet as to speak, so to speak. It's crazy. You yeah. and, and nobody would have known you guys. This was early on, right? Nobody knew you, who you guys were. I, I, I mean, I bet you they would have. I, yeah. It wasn't that early. Okay. It was, uh, you know, that was what was kind of cool about it. Nobody really re thought about us. They were thinking Watched, about him, yeah. you know. So we were able to, like, get really, really close up to the stage. Right. Yeah, I assume you were both on acid at the time at the Timothy Leary <laughs> lecture. Yeah. I would think. Right, okay. <laughs> um... And then uh, you had also told a quick story about, I don't know if you remember this, Captain Beefheart, you guys were on a plane and he was on acid. Oh, yeah. Again, a little thing that didn't make the book. What was the story with Captain Beefheart on the plane? Oh, yeah, he was, he was really mad because, you know, we were all on the plane. We were coming back from Utah, I think it was. So, you know, beautiful desert and stuff. He goes, look at these people, man. They're not even looking out the window. This is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And <laughs> he was he was going crazy, you know. Nice. I couldn't believe that people just didn't even care about uh, the beautiful desert below. Right. Was he, you know, did any, and nobody bothers to say anything, or was he, like, causing a scene, or what was going on? No, it wasn't that bad. It was, uh, but he, he, he made his, his thoughts known, let me put it that way. Okay. <laughs> um, one of the other interactions, you guys shared a bill with Little Richard uh, at a festival in Toronto. And I wanted to get, you know, again, this is a little interesting fact, but uh, about Jim's reaction to seeing Little Richard play live. Yeah, well, unfortunately, we had to follow Little Richard mm. that night, and uh, he just blew the place away, you know. He, he did most of the show standing on top of the piano, the grand piano, with his uh, uh, crazy clothes and stuff. And uh, Jim didn't know, he didn't know what to do, you know. <laughs> How did he top that? And uh, so what he did was he gave this little speech uh, because it was really a, it was supposed to be a 50s type thing. I don't know how we got on the bill, but uh, he, he gave a really cool little uh, ode to, to all those guys. Chuck Berry, I think, was there. Um, Alice Cooper was there. and and somebody gave him a chicken on stage and, and he pretended to strangle it or something. Um, but there, there was some, you know, really cool acts. Uh, right. So you're saying Jim was like giving like a speech of respect to all yeah, these guys who came before exactly. and like paved the path? Yeah, I don't know if that's, uh, if you can hear that on, online somewhere. No, someone will find it somewhere if it exists. Right. The uh, Well, it was just crazy to me because again, you guys played with so many luminary bands like from the day and like the that was was that the one time jim was intimidated by and little richard was the only guy he was afraid to follow i think so fair to say yeah, okay yeah that's crazy uh <laughs> very great compliment to little richard yeah, yeah. and because i believe if i'm right john lennon was at that same oh yeah john thing. john and yoko so yeah but you guys didn't get to meet them or talk to them there uh, a little bit a little bit um 
Yoko did the entire the entire show from inside a, a garbage bag. Okay. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty cool. All right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, John and Yoko, uh, I don't know who was first billed. But did you get to converse with John at all? Uh, a little bit. Just, know. hi, how you doing? Yeah, yeah. This is sort of a running theme in your book, is that back in the day, it was just so not cool to gush yeah, over people. Yeah, you had you to just be cool. Do that. And I mean, you can, well, man, I wouldn't have been here today if it weren't for you, you know. Yeah. But that, that's not how it was. You, you had to be cool. Right. You know, even the time I sat with Jimi Hendrix for seven hours on the plane. Right. I, I couldn't, you know. Hey, yeah. I like the he album. was like my hero, you know. Yeah. We talk about that in the book. So we'll let, again, let people read about the Jimi Hendrix story. Uh, another one is uh, Bob Marley. You met him right on his, was it his first trip to the States, I believe, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, he was staying at uh, our, our lawyer's house. And um, uh, and so the, this guy had a big old house, with, and he had a guest house out in the back. So the whole band stayed in the guest house. And if you got 20 feet from that house, you were overwhelmed by the smoke. <laughs> it was amazing. So did you walk in? Did you get to exchange any words with Bob? Like Yeah, we did a little bit. Uh, you know, we, we knew his uh, keyboard player, Tyrone. So um, he, you know, he introduced us and stuff. But uh, once again, it was just, you know. Very quick. Hey, man, cool. Did you, uh, did you get to smoke weed with Bob Marley at all? Uh, gosh, if, if I did, I was too stoned to remember. <laughs> um, this was, it was sort of an interesting thing, like, because you and John, uh, after the doors ended, you guys were in England together, you formed the Butts Band together, and, uh, you talk about in the book that, you know, reggae was just starting to really happen in the UK at the time, you guys were living right. over there, so you guys were kind of early fans of reggae, right, back in the, in yeah, the day. Yeah, yeah, we were totally into it. In fact, we... We were doing an album there with this thing we called the Buttsman, and um, we had Phil Chen, who's a great bass player, who played with Jeff Beck and Rod Stewart, and uh, and Phil was from Jamaica, and he's always talking about reggae and this and that. So we we decided to do the last half of our album in Jamaica, so we uh, Dynamic Studios which is where all the cool Marley stuff was was done. And uh, that was quite quite an experience, which we tell about in the book. Right, well you've got, as uh, I believe Jimmy Cliff, was he recording right next door? Yeah. Well, and you he, guys knew who he was, but he oh, didn't yeah. know he, who you were? <laughs> yeah, no idea. Yeah. <laughs> Just mad that you're taking up his studio yeah, time? Yeah, wasn't too, in too good of a mood to uh, hang out. Right. Um, and so uh, another, Big presence in this book is uh, your wife, Lynn, and, uh, you know, we joked a lot uh, while we were working on this that she could really have a, a book of her own, so mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you have any favorite Lynn stories, uh, any that may in the book or didn't make the book. I don't know if there's your favorite moments from uh, the life of, of Lynn <laughs> Varis Krieger. Well, there's a time that she hung out with Elvis, of course, with, that's in the book, so I won't tell about that, but, uh, you know, she was from... Uh, New Jersey, but she left home when she was 16 and started, you know, and moved to New York. And uh, she just, uh, she got to hang out in all the cool clubs, you know. She worked at Arthur's Club, where the twist was uh, very big at the time, and uh, places like that. And, uh, you know, she really could write her own book with all the people she's uh, met. And uh, she just told me a story the other night that I never heard before, but I can't remember what it was. Don't remember what it was? Let's get her on the phone. <laughs> yeah. She saved it till now. We could have used it in the book. I know. Uh, the, um, well, let's see. I also have a couple, uh, I wanted to show you a couple pictures and just uh, kind of walk down memory lane with you about uh, some of these pictures. So here's a picture of, uh, this is a picture of you guys uh, at the first Doors billboard. So as, as you know, we understand it, Jack Holtzman, uh, head of Electra Records, he kind of came up with this idea, right? Putting up the billboard. Yeah. And there's a million shots from this day. So can you walk me through like what's going on here? Oh, well, they had this 
silly idea that we should go down there while they're putting up the billboard and pretend like we're helping to put it up. You mm -hmm. know? That's kind of dumb. <laughs> so you guys are feeling kind of self-conscious here? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Um, but the day before, we got to go and see them actually making the billboard. Mm -hmm. That was kind of cool, see how they blow up the images and stuff. Right. And now again, like you talked about Jim being particularly self-conscious. I mean, was he excited about this when it was finally up, or was he like, I don't know, like what was the general feeling with the rest of the band? I think we were... It was kind of both, you know, we were kind of, wow, is this too commercial or what, you know? Mm -hmm. But then again, we thought, hey, no other band has ever had a billboard like this, you know? And uh, it was our first album, and, uh, you know, we, we definitely thought it was cool. Yeah. There's other pictures, too, where you guys are up at the very top of it, you know, legs hanging over. Is it scary at all, or was it, like, very secure up there? Yeah, it, was, it wasn't. It wasn't no too windy, deal. luckily. That okay. Time. <laughs> um, another shot here is this is Henry Diltz at the uh, Henry Diltz's famous shot Hollywood Bowl yeah. and uh, we talk about you, you know you mentioned the Hollywood Bowl obviously you've got this big wall of amplifiers right so the acoustic amplifiers right. so what's what's re the, the story what's going on really with the, all those amps and at the Hollywood Bowl mm -hmm. so we you know we were uh, we were signed up with this amp company acoustic amps and they made really good bass amp, uh, the 360, and they made nice uh, keyboard amps and PA type amps, uh, but the guitar amps weren't that great, to tell you the truth, they sucked. Uh, so I, I jimmied mine up, you know, to, to make it sound better. And Vince, our, our sound guy, put JBLs in it and stuff, and so at least I had, uh, had one that sounded decent. But that night at the bowl, we decided, hey, let's get a whole bunch of these things, these amps, and just have it go all the way across the stage. You know, that was the time where Cream was uh, using a bunch of Marshalls and Jimi Hendrix as well. And, you know, they would, they would do maybe four amps each, you know, which was really loud. I mean, I saw Hendrix at the Whiskey when he first came. And I just couldn't believe how loud it was. I think he only had two marshals. Hmm. So we ended up with 52. We had 52 amps spread all the way across the Hollywood Bowl stage. And uh, we're, so we're sound checking. It's really loud, <laughs> really, really cool, we thought. And this guy moseys up to the stage. And, by the way, you guys, uh, you can't play over 100 decibels at the Hollywood Bowl. And, you know, we were probably 150 at that <laughs> point and getting louder. So, uh, so we ended up having to turn them all off except for <laughs> one each, you know. It was pretty silly. It's one, so it's all a big wall, but only your guitars yeah, is coming out of the one, right? Yeah, and, and my guitar just sounded horrible. It was like so... It was just didn't have the uh, the sound that I wanted, you know. Here's uh, here's another picture of you guys at the uh, Strange Days studio sessions. So this is in uh, Sunset Sound, right? Yep. And yep. so, yeah, what was it like to work at, uh, you, you did just the first two albums there? Yeah, and part of the third. Right. Um, it was cool, it was, uh, you know, uh, today, studios are, look kind of like my studio here, mm -hmm. um, but can you pan around a little bit? Yeah, uh, well. Okay, um, but in those days, uh, studios were like very workmanlike, uh, you know, cottage cheese ceilings and, and shitty linoleum floors, um, and Sunset Sound had a very low ceiling compared to most. Uh, but we got the good sound out of it. What they did have was this great echo chamber, which we utilized quite a bit. And um, uh, you know, I've, I've been back there recently, and uh, it really hasn't changed that much. Yeah. The uh, this also is your first, right? This is your first guitar, the SG Special. Yeah, looks like it. So yeah, that's gone missing now, right? It's gone. Yeah, for... unfortunately, that was stolen back in after they finished the second album, and uh, but uh, luckily through writing this book, 
Jeff has managed to uh, uh, find a guy that, that, that knew the serial number of my guitar. Well, yeah, we're going to so. launch a, a worldwide search very soon, so everybody please stay tuned to the to search for Robbie's guitar. Yeah. We'll get you. And then speaking of guitars, this is another shot of you at the London Fog. Right. And this is, so you're not playing your, your trademark SG Special here, so what could, this is a, what is that, it, a town and country? That's actually Ray's brother's guitar. Okay. It's a Sears silver town, I guess. And I think we looked it up. It's it the has, town and country, right? Yeah, the town and country. Yeah. And it's got all these knobs on it that they didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> they look cool. Yeah. But uh, I used that for a slide on, on uh, Moonlight Drive, I guess. Right. So that's the Moonlight Drive guitar. Yeah. And where is, and so again, where is this guitar gone to? Does Rick Manzarek still have it? or? That's a good question. All right. We've got to find that one next. Okay. Yeah. And this is, so this is the London Fog. I don't know if you have any, if uh, looking at that picture ever brings up memories, I guess, of those first early bar mm -hmm. shows. Well, it was, uh, you know, it was a small place, uh, but the good thing about it was it was near the whiskey. And so the people that that ran the whiskey came down there a lot to uh, see what was going on. And uh, there was this girl, Ronnie Heron, who uh, her uh, deal, she was the booker at the whiskey. And she was very hip, you know, she she was from New York, so she, she knew all the managers and this and that. And she liked us. I think she liked Jim. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so she hired us to uh, play at the Whiskey. Yeah, the Just the night the London Fog was closing, we started playing at the Whiskey. Oh, the rest is history. Yeah. And then this is a, uh, a picture of you guys outside the Doors workshop on Santa Monica, right? Right. So, uh, I, just, I sort of just love this, you know, I guess you think of rock bands, they're out there, you know, partying, they let other people kind of do all the paperwork and whatever. You guys sort of, to an extent, were very self-managed. You had Bill Siddons. I don't want to take credit away from Bill Siddons. I know he worked hard, but like, it, it, you guys were so very directly involved with the, the way that your career was shaped. Right. Um, you know, at first we did have managers, uh, you know, our, our, our uh, lawyer, who my dad got for us, his name was Max Pink, and he was like a, he was from uh, the South, you know, he was very uh, a Southern gentleman, I guess you could say. And uh, so, you know, we, we, my dad thought we should get a manager, a real manager, and uh, we got these guys, uh, Asher Dan and Sal Bonafetti. So Asher Dan was actually a real estate guy in L.A. If you look on the bus stops, you'd see Asher Dan Realty, you know. And Sal had managed uh, Dion and the Belmonts, stuff like that. And, you know, they were kind of old school manager types and just to, didn't work with, especially with Jim. They were always trying to make Jim go solo. Oh, you don't need these guys, you know. So uh, we got rid of them, and, and Bill Siddons, who was our uh, road manager, um, he ended up, uh, we said, you can do what they do, man. Just all you got to do is call the agent and field the calls and stuff like that. And uh, he, he took to it right away. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of being self-managed, but with Billy Siddons, who turned out to be a really good manager, he later did... Uh, David Crosby and um, all those guys. Yeah, the uh, of all the story, you know, one. It's funny when we were uh, we had early drafts of the book, and I was sending it to people, getting notes from people, and out of all the stories about, you know, that that are wild and crazy in this book, one of the things that kept coming back to me is people go, so. Jim Morrison had his own desk? Like, he showed up for work and had a desk? <laughs> so I think that blows people away more than anything. Is yeah, that, uh, I mean, he did have his own desk, and, uh, you know, he wasn't really uh, there a lot of the time, but when he was, he was, uh, he was involved, you know? Mm -hmm. He would, uh, you know, okay this gig or that gig, or, uh, more than, than most artists, I would say. Right. And, you know, Ray and John and I weren't, we weren't into that. So, you know, the good thing was that Jim pretty much lived right across the street in a motel, hmm. crappy motel, $3 a night, uh, the Alta Cienega. 
you can stay in his room right now. Uh, I think they charge a hundred dollars. Sure. But uh, so he was right across the street, and if he was bored, he would go to the office, and it worked out great. Yeah. You know that. Uh, so I just heard recently that building that used to be the Doors office. Uh, they just moved, do you remember the tail of the pup hot dog stand? It's like, yeah. A, yeah, they just moved, they restored it, and they just moved it to right in front of that building. So apparently the tail of the pup is now in front of the, the Doors building. Really? So we'll, so see, we'll what, go over there, see if we can get a free hot dog. Yeah, <laughs> drop your name and see what happens. So what, what's the office then? That's I don't know if they're, I don't know what they're going to do with it. I got to go, we got to go drop by. So I mean, tail of the pup owns it? I think, I don't know if they put it right in front or next door, but it's, they said it's right by that, by the old doors office. So we got to, it's, this is all news. We got to go figure it out <laughs> after this. Well, before the doors office was a, a restaurant, I mean, in the last couple of years it was. Mm -hmm. uh, first it was a Mexican and then Italian, I think. Yeah. It keeps changing hands. It was like an office yeah. of, you know, some charity thing or a doctor's office. I don't know, but yeah, now it's a hot dog stand. So there you go. <laughs> It's a good location. Yeah. It's right on the corner of La Cienega and Santa Monica Boulevard. And uh, they used to have a place, a, a strip place, or actually two strip places. There was the phone booth and then the extension of the phone booth. Right. And uh, Jim spent quite a bit of time in those places. <laughs> um, let's see. So also... Uh, how are we doing on time? We can keep going. Okay, we got. Um, so, one of the other things that you know you talked about again didn't didn't quite make the book, but I just was personally fascinated by this is that you got to play at the Bohemian Grove. Uh, Bohemian Grove for people who don't know, it's sort of like what is it like a summer camp retreat for wealthy, powerful, uh, connected people. And there's all these conspiracy theories. Everyone says, oh, they run the world and they're this and that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Robbie Krieger, are you a lizard person? Are you in charge of the <laughs> global economy? Have you been, you know, uh, artificially inflating things? Well, I'm, I mean, I, when I went there, I've been there a few number of times, but um, it's mostly for the music. There's always cool musicians that hang out there for some reason. And uh, I keep, you know, we hear about, oh, well, Kissinger was here when when the, uh, that bomb went off or something like that. You know, there was this one air house up there. It's like a, not a house, but a, a glorified tent. And that, that was supposed to be where all the big guys used to meet and, you know, and they could uh, make things happen. That was pretty cool. Gotcha. But as, and you were up there with, was it Bob Weir or who did you go up with? Um, I was there with uh, my buddy uh, Scotty Medlock, who I do these uh, benefits for. We can, we'll talk about him in a minute. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, he he knew all these t types, and and you know, I, I heard, oh, Bob Weir's going to be there, Garcia's going to be there, uh, and uh, so I would say, yeah, let's go. And you know, so every night they'd have a jam. It, it, they had about twelve or fourteen uh, camps. Mm -hmm. in this area where there's beautiful redwood trees. And uh, every night it would be at a different camp, they'd have a jam. And uh, all kinds of guys would show up there. It's kind of cool. A lot of San Francisco guys like like Bob Weir. You had said uh, Conan O'Brien was there. He did like some sort of skit. What do you, what do you remember from that? Well, uh, they also do plays. And they, uh, and these plays, must take months to put together, you know, rehearsals, all that stuff. Um, and they always have a play every year. And this time it was uh, Conan uh, was one of the uh, main figures in the play. And uh, I did some music for that one, I think. Hmm. And uh, it's pretty cool because these plays, there's no phones allowed at the camp. You have to leave your phone at the front and so these plays are played once and never again mm -hmm. you know all this work <laughs> just for one night and uh, never see the light of day other than that do you remember anything about it what it was or what he was joking about or it was about it was about the advent of uh, of the internet and cell phones and it was kind of a comedy sure but uh, yeah, that was quite a while ago. All right. 
Uh, but yeah, you didn't see anyone plotting uh, global destabilization or anything well, like that, wars? No, the, the other thing about it is that supposedly these, uh, it was, in ha uh, s some of the guys that went there were, were these, um, I don't know how you call them, um, they were into witchcraft and, you know, uh, Goths, who, who are those yeah, guys uh, that are supposedly run the government and, Sure. You yeah. know, it's conspiracy Same. type stuff, yeah, yeah. you know. And they used to do this thing uh, every year with uh, with uh, this this big tree, and they and they would they would supposedly burn somebody. Right. <laughs> well, the there's stake. an owl or something. You're supposed to yeah yeah sing to the owl. I don't know. It's weird stuff, mm -hmm. you know. And. But that was that's been kind of downplayed over the past thirty years. So or you so. don't remember? This was back in the thirties that that was kind of happening. You didn't say a speech to the owl, anything like that. Not really. Maybe. All right. You wouldn't tell me if, uh, if you I did. did. I right? couldn't yeah. tell you if I did. Um, okay, uh, so we've got some questions also some, that some fans had sent in. Um, somebody was asking, you know, your thought. Like Jim Morrison also uh, just released a, a book, um, a huge amazing compendium of all his poetry songs uh you know all these right. ideas notes it wasn't jim it was his family. well of course family. yes I, I did i blow the big secret that jim's alive releasing books yes uh so yeah so the the morrison estate uh released this new book uh so yeah just wanted to get your thoughts about that particular book and well uh, it's pretty amazing really it's got so much stuff and i i never realized that jim had that much uh poetry that sitting around you mm -hmm. know his sister and brother Andy, and uh, they had collected somehow. And I mean, there's so many times when I remember Jim would have a notebook and be writing, and and then he'd just leave it in the taxi or something, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably more than half of, of the stuff that he wrote is not in that book. But I mean, it's a big book. It's like a huge coffee table book, and it's just full of amazing. Uh, lyrics and thoughts, uh, stuff he was thinking about. Was that like, I mean, what is it like to, I mean, again, you've had now 50 years of seeing his writings and the songs and re-releases and things like that. I mean, it, to hold that book and to see how thick it is, is that, uh, was there a reaction that you had when you first saw it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was really amazed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and especially, you know, there was nothing, nothing, uh, trite or bad in there you mm -hmm. know it was all cool stuff yeah yeah uh someone was also Can i take this off i go nuts yeah right That'd be all continuity right. error are we okay mm -hmm. um someone was also asking about uh henry diltz and they wanted the story behind the the morrison hotel shoot you guys uh discovered this hotel and, and ran in for a photo you want to tell that story well, I think everybody knows. It's a pretty well story. known story. <laughs> the interesting thing to me is that 50 years after Morrison Hotel, uh, you guys they they actually recreated the window and everything. Are they? Do you know anything? Are they going to keep the Morrison Hotel windows now that it's uh, been refurbished? Well, I think that was just uh, just for that night, mm -hmm. kind of really. But this guy actually bought the hotel. And he's going to redo it as a real hotel, mm -hmm. and, and there's going to be a big doors exhibit, you know, downstairs. And nice. Yeah, it'll, it'll be the Morrison Hotel. There you go. And yes, for more story, we can again point people to the book. You tell talk about that story and some other little unknown details. Yeah, I mean, we did this uh, uh, on the day of the doors, which is January fourth, uh, or is it the tenth? Fourth, sure. It's the fourth every year. Um, we actually went down to the hotel and, like he said, we recreated that window where, the, where they shot the album cover. And so people, all the fans could come in and get behind the window and take a picture. Gotcha. That was pretty cool. And uh, they were also, another uh, person wrote in with a question about the process of collaborating on songwriting. Now, sometimes I know you would write songs, sometimes Jim would write songs, or you guys would write together. When, I think they're specifically asking about you know, times when the whole band came together. How did that kind of work? Well, I think the main time that happened was uh, on uh, L.A. Woman. Because um, that album, we, we actually did the album in our rehearsal place 
which we were talking about before, right on Santa Monica Boulevard and La Cienega. So, you know, it was just kind of, we would just go in there and start jamming and see what happened, you know, and, and some cool stuff happened, man. It was like Riders on the Storm, uh, Elliot Woman, the song itself happened that way. And, you know, I, I really uh, think that if Jim had lived, that, that's how we would have done recording in the future. Yeah. You yeah. say that that's like your favorite studio experience working on LA Woman? Yeah, I, I think so because, uh, you know, the like the first album we were so nervous, you know, never having recorded before. And then the second album, um, Paul Rothschild started, you know, hey, we got time, money, now we can record all day and let's spend four hours on a drum sound, you know. Um, although he did do do some great stuff absolutely too. yeah um and then you know and and after a while you get what's called the third album syn syndrome where you you know you're playing all the time before you get signed and then you get you have enough songs for two albums but then the third album uh it gets a little uh a little bit you run out of material yeah, yeah. um so you have to write in the studio and that takes up a lot of time and, and money so that we're that's kind of where we were at this point in, in LA Woman, um, but we didn't have to worry about money or time because we had our own place, you know, and uh, it was just really fun just uh, seeing what we could come up with uh, on the fly. Yeah, we have, uh, and of course, the LA Woman, the 50th anniversary release of LA Woman is coming up soon. That's true. Um, that's true. So uh, there's some pretty cool stuff in that. It's going to be like a box set, kind of, you know, with the vinyl, but also has a lot of uh, unheard uh, stuff that, you know, we didn't, we never used. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it'll give you an idea of how, how we kind of wrote these songs together. Right. I was actually, you had talked about uh, L.A. Woman, the, the song itself. Um, it just again so interesting to hear about how you had there's so many rough edges on that song like is it jim comes in a little early and the tempo build up just happens maybe a little too fast not mathematically perfect mm -hmm. um and so i just i i kind of again i love re-listening to these songs after talking to you about you know pointing all that stuff out but also i mean is there something to be said about how this was the vibe of that record trumps the the you know technicalities of you know trying to get everything perfect all the time well i i mean I think so. Uh, in my mind, uh, you know, that's the thing about door songs is uh, a lot of times we would we wouldn't be perfect, you know. It would be uh, three bars instead of four bars until Jim came in. You know, he never came in when it, we thought he would. Um, and uh, you know, nowadays it's like you would never do that. Nobody, no group would ever do something like that and uh, to me it, it just made it so much cooler that uh, you could be a little loose and and, and if, if it works then that's what you do you know you don't automatically just all right put it on the pro tools make it exactly you got you know click track um, has to be perfectly uh, you know the same all the way through mm -hmm. um, our songs were a lot of times they, they would speed up and slow down. So and we never did them twice the same way uh, right. on stage. <laughs> <laughs> even yeah, even hearing some of the outtakes like Morrison Hotel, you've heard like Roadhouse Blues outtakes and things like that, and it's amazing how like yeah, it would have been a whole different song if you had just used one take earlier or one take later, and so yeah, yeah. it's always different. Yeah, this has the same type of thing. Yeah. A lot of versions uh, of Roadhouse. I mean, uh, different tracks. Um, yeah. Yeah, Riders on the Storm and, and Valley Woman and a couple others. Cool. The uh, So in the course of working with you and, and doing all the, the research, making sure we get all the facts right, of you know, I dove into all these uh, forums and listening to fans. And uh, one of the big things that comes up with hardcore fans uh, all the time is Paris Blues. This is Where's Paris Blues? We want to, this is a, a allegedly a song that was recorded during L.A. Woman, right? So there is, there's recently, I guess now there's some information or rumors, people are saying it could have been on Soft Parade, so there's this big debate. So 
as you recall it, right, you, you believe it's a, an L.A. woman track, is that right? No, I think it was earlier. You think it's off parade now? Yeah, okay. yeah. I, I'm not sure, but uh, I think uh, if it was uh, on L.A. woman, I don't see why it wouldn't have got on the record. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, we did, we did uh, quite a few blues um, on the record, and I, I tell about Blues Day in, in the book where... Uh, Jim Jim really wanted to do blues. He wanted the whole album to be blues if it was up to him. And so we said, okay, Jim, Tuesday we're going to do nothing but blues, okay? And he was so happy. He said, oh boy, yeah, let's do that. And uh, so comes Tuesday, no Jim, and then show up. <laughs> so we had to wait till the next day. Gotcha. But if we had done Paris Blues, I think there would be you know, versions of it uh, on that uh, on the same tapes that uh, you know cars hiss by my window. Right. And, uh, but I mean, so my theory was so if it's on Soft Parade, so we had talked about this a lot. We, you and I, kind of went back and forth trying to figure this out. Um, and on Soft Parade, though, Paul Rothschild, your producer. It seemed like he was getting very strict at that time and everything was very controlled and you had the orchestra and all these other musicians in there. Would you have time to, hey, let's do a little blues jam while we're at it? You know, would that have even been a well, thing? Well, we did. Okay. We did. Uh, one night we all went out to dinner and next door, this Mexican place, and um, had a little too much to drink. And, <laughs> and we came back and we so you're jamming. I, I, I think there's there's tapes of that. Um, but you're right, why wouldn't, uh, why wouldn't the Paris there? Blues be on that? My and the other thing is, you know, Paris, Jim was thinking about going to Paris. Exactly. So, uh, so it's still a debate, we just don't know, yeah, can't say either way? Yeah, but as far as I remember, it was uh, earlier. Okay. I feel like we, you, know, you and I tried to fact check this the best we could, and I was getting very tense about it, you know, if we're going to put this book out, and then what happens if, and, and uh, your immortal words were, we have to be wrong about something. That was, uh, <laughs> so that was the little behind the scenes of what it was to work on the book. You were you're just like, it's not a Doors book if we don't get something wrong. So it's possible we'll be disproven, but uh, we'll see. Well, I mean, you know, and the funny thing is we, we do have a tape of it, mm -hmm. but somehow Ray had the tape at home. It's just a cassette. And, uh, and don't ask me why there's not a multi-track of it, but Ray had this cassette at home and his son Pablo got a hold. He was a, just a little kid, and he started pushing record in the middle of. So there's parts that are missing, mm -hmm. and and to tell you the truth, it's kind of a stupid blues. It's a, not a good song anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So who gives a shit? Uh, it's just because they can't. They, everybody wants what they can't have, but yeah. 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 Uh, so, obviously the Oliver Stone movie, The Doors, this is, uh, for better or worse, this is part of the legacy now, it's part of uh, The Doors uh, mm -hmm. legend. Um, in the book you give uh, some behind the scenes looks, you know, of what it was to be on set, what it was to make that movie, uh, the reaction to it. This is sort of unique because when John Densmore wrote his book, that movie hadn't been made yet, and when Ray wrote his book, he wasn't involved with any of the, the filming. Um, so for anyone who's a fan of that movie, this, I think there's some really interesting revelations. Uh, obviously it is not a historic retelling of the Doors story, but do you have any favorite scenes, favorite moments from that book where they got it right, or favorite scenes where they were just so completely off that it's almost humorous, anything like that? Uh, in the movie? Mm hmm Well, um, there's one, one part where Jim locks Pamela into the closet and sets it on fire. As far as I know, that never happened. Uh, that was just a fact. It's a pretty big liberty, yeah, yeah right there. Yeah, um, and uh, you know, I think uh, you know when, when I worked on the movie, I was always there for the filming of the live music parts, mm -hmm. and I think those are really good, especially Bal Kilmer. Uh, his, his he sang, he really sang most of that stuff live which is uh, pretty incredible. I thought he should get an Academy Award. Um, in fact, the reason he got that part was because he actually had a Doors tribute band that he was the singer of. And uh, he showed a video of it to Oliver, and that was it. Right. 
So that at least Oliver got that right. He, he wanted to, you know, make sure that the and that's what I wanted was to make sure the music was all really correct and and good. Right. Uh, so let's see. You are a guy. One of the things I love about you, uh, you musically, you cannot be stopped. Uh, you are constantly playing, still touring to this day. Um, you know, we're here in your studio where you're still, you know, you had one album that just came out last year, right? Ritual Begins at Sundown. And you've got another one in the can, and aren't you working on it? Like, you're like three albums down. Like, you're recording them faster than you can release yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. And where does that come from, that drive, I guess, you know? Um, I wouldn't know what else to do with myself, I guess. Uh, you know, I love music, and um, I actually uh, bought this place about seven years ago and it was just a square building mm -hmm. they made computer parts or something and so we, we were able to build it out you know exactly how you would want a studio with you know the walls none of the walls are parallel so you don't get bouncing sound and stuff and um, just uh, it was really cool to have a place where you could uh, come and play record and then I got I have a lot of cool people that come in here in here to record and then I get to play with them too so All right it's kind of neat do you rent out the is it just mostly for you stuff do you produce what what's the what's the day to day both here? all kinds of stuff like you know we uh, we've had uh, some great uh, acts in here um, and sometimes I I get to play on a couple of tracks and. Uh, but you know, really, it's uh, in in my mind. It was just for me to uh, be able to record whatever I wanted. Yeah. And uh, which we you know, that was one thing about the pandemic that worked out was able to uh, record like three three albums uh, of new stuff. Right. So yeah. Uh... The next one that's coming out is called Rocks versus Dub. Okay. And so it's a reggae, it's an instrumental reggae album of songs that you probably have heard, like, a, you know, it's got a Beatles song, uh, it's got uh, Bee Gees. Okay. Um, Dub Bob version Dylan, of Bee Gees, okay. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I think it came out really great. Yeah, this is uh, another thing that, uh, one of the things that I love uh, hearing about is that you actually got to witness a lot of real early punk rock bands as well. Like I grew up on punk rock music, but obviously I was a little bit younger, missed the, that first wave, but you got to see Fear at the Troubadour, you got to see the Clash's first US tour, you got to see uh, X in the early days through Ray. Uh, you know, punk rockers are very concerned about credibility. You have a lot of punk rock credibility for seeing all those those early shows. And you were you were a new wave guy, right? Well, I mean, I just came a little bit later on. So, yeah. but uh, but yeah, you started a new wave band called Red Shift, uh, and I just love the story of how this band came to be. So, I want you to share the uh, the Red Shift story. How did you start and end up starting a new wave band? Well, uh, this kid came over to my house. I don't even know how he got my address, but he he said, "I just got." Uh, he knocks on the door. Hi, I'm Mac Mac McKenzie. Uh, I just got off the airplane from England and I, I, with the express idea of finding you and trying to uh, do some something musical with you, you know. And you know, you, normally I wouldn't open the door <laughs> or even let him through the front gate, but uh, somehow the gate was open and this guy comes up and I, and I, I don't know, I guess I was just in the right mood. I said, okay, let's go upstairs. I had a little studio upstairs. <laughs> and uh, he had some really cool stuff. Um, and uh, so I, I got a couple of really, I said, okay, well, what if we get some really pro musicians and, and, and instead of your normal punk kind of guys and, uh, and see how good we can make it, you know? And so we do. We got we had Vinnie Kaliuta, which is, you know who played for Zappa and stuff, and Arthur Barrow, who was my friend from early on, who also was with Zappa, and uh, we we formed this uh, band. We did three or four uh, shows around town, uh, and until Mac kind of went off the deep end and 
I think he was too into Morrison. Ah, okay. Did kind of a similar thing. But I love that, uh, I just want to get that message out to everyone on the internet. Just show up at Robbie's house, we'll start a <laughs> band with you. Let's, let, let's encourage people to do that no, more often. I say I learned the hard way, don't do that. <laughs> well, as you had another story about somebody showing up, I mean, <laughs> like where you weren't, you pretended to not be home or something, or you were a... Oh yeah, I mean, it happens all the time. I mean, there's this one guy, shit, maybe he'll see this. Yeah. Anyway, he keeps, uh, he keeps uh, sending me stuff to sign, and for some reason I just, I, I, I just didn't like how he kind of presented the uh, request, you know what I'm saying? Uh, there was something weird about it, so I never wrote him back, never signed nothing for him, and he was from Germany. And then, this went on for years and years, and then one day I got, I, he, he writes a, a letter saying, Oh, I'm on my way to L.A. Can I stay at your house for a while? <laughs> <laughs> How did you know I was even in L.A.? You know, I, it was crazy. So luckily, I, I had been out of my house for a while because we had black mold and we were redoing the house. And I told my neighbors, hey, if this weird guy shows up asking about me, just say I'm not here, you know. And he showed up. And okay. my neighbor uh, told him... Uh, I forget what he told them, but yeah, they moved out. Yeah, so he never. I haven't, haven't heard from him since. There you go. Until now, now he'll start no, writing well. me again. Yeah, as long as he bought a ticket to the live talk, so he bought a book. Yeah, he'll come by, get it signed, start a band with you. Why not? Uh -huh. The um, but yeah, let's see what else do I have. Oh, and also early another thing. There's punk rock, and then also skateboarding. I was excited to hear about. So, Robbie Krieger. People don't know you got really into skateboarding uh -huh. in the. 70s and, and into the 80s, right? Well, even in the 50s. Right, back in the day. Yeah. But well, it was like once they had the urethane wheels, that's where you yeah. kind of... Well, I mean, I, when I started, it was just roller skate wheels, and you nailed them onto a 2 by 4 mm -hmm. And um, we used to skate up into town every night. And then, uh, yeah, like you say, when the, when the good wheels came out, I, uh, I started to... I was so into it, I built my own ramp. In my, in my backyard, I had a wooden ramp. Um, my friends had one. Uh, my dentist, had, his kids had, had a ramp in their backyard. And I used to go over there and Tony Alva would show up and um, who's the other guy, um, the crazy one with the blonde hair. Was it Jay Adams? Yeah, or? Jay Adams. Wow, okay. And so I used to keep my surfboard at this guy's house because it was in Malibu and he, and, and Tony Alba used to love my board. He, he would always use it. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I actually played with Tony. He, had, he plays bass and he has a band. So that was pretty cool. It's very cool. That is some serious yeah, skate, yeah, skater die actually, credibility right I, here. I was actually good enough that I, I went to the skate park. Hmm. They had this, the first skate park was in uh, kind of down by the airport. And, uh, you know, it's like pool right type, vertical skating and then one day I flew off of my ramp in the backyard and messed my knee up and I said oh, what am I doing <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of that yeah you did you used to have a pool and did you skate your pool in your backyard or yeah okay yeah. that's all it's all filled in now no more pool yeah it, it started cracking and stuff so yeah. I gave up on the pool Gotcha. But yeah, it's, but, it's... But other than the pool, I, after the pool, I actually had a, a wooden ramp that mm -hmm. I built out there, which was kind of uneven on one side. Sure. Because <laughs> I built it myself. You built it yourself. You do all the woodwork, everything. Pretty much. Oh, yeah. All right. This is, I mean, it's crazy to me to think about because I guess when you would have started, it would have been right after the doors or something. And Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So this is, I mean, again, it's like, I, I always have to reorient myself. It's like, oh, after the doors, well, you were... A grown up, and I'm like, you were what 25 when that band, you know, when Jim passed away. So you're right. you're still, I mean, maybe too old to go to a skate park, but still very young, right? Well, I mean, I, I went to the skate park. I was easily the oldest guy there. <laughs> right. You know, I was like 30 or more. Hmm. All right, but yeah, punk rock and skateboard credibility. You can't be stopped. Uh, the other thing I would love to to trumpet on your behalf is uh, the annual Medlock Krieger uh, charity golf. Uh, tournament and celebrity concert. This is something that you do every year uh, and you've invited me a couple times. It's an amazing event. 
you guys raise like a ton of money for St. Jude's uh, Children's Hospital. Right. And uh, can you ta just talk more about the event? It's uh, an invitational golf uh, tournament, and then you have a concert. Is it the same night, the night after? Tell me how it's, it's structured again. I mean, well, usually the, uh, the first night we do the concert, mm -hmm. and then the next day is a golf tournament. So uh, we've had uh, some great, great people that have done it. Um, the guys from KISS do it, you know, uh, Alice Cooper, uh, Alex from Rush. Um, so uh, unfortunately, you know, after doing all this great uh, money raising for, for cancer, both myself and Scotty Medlock got cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, that shows that, uh, um, what do you call it? Um, karma? Karma um, doesn't work <laughs> yeah. all, all the time. Not always. I mean, there must be a reason for this. But anyway, so this year it's going to be really scaled back. It's just going to be more of a, a, a party for Scotty, who's not doing very well. Right. And... Um, but it has been a really a cool part of my life. That, and uh, Scotty is an amazing guy. He's, uh, I met him at Riviera uh, back in 93 or something like that when he was doing the paintings of the, of the winner of the golf tournament mm -hmm. every year. And he, he, he's, he's done some amazing uh, paintings. Uh, in fact, there's one uh, he did of James Dean that I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna buy it. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you guys do auctions, and you know, you have crazy level of like memorabilia and cool stuff at this thing. So, mm -hmm. and then how long has it been going on? Med when did you guys start uh, Medlock Krieger? About Thirteen years ago. Wow. Okay. So yeah. They actually, the first couple were actually Scott Till. I mean, uh, uh, Matt was Tillman. Was it Pat Tillman? Pat Tillman. Yes. Pat Tillman Foundation, which was pretty cool. Scotty knew Pat's brother, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, so they had a foundation that would give scholarships to uh, kids of fallen veterans. Right. Um, and, then, and then later we switched to uh, St. Jude's right. Children's Hospital. And, uh, they, and well, there was a story there too. Didn't you go to the, the main St. Jude's location and meet with people from there? Yeah, yeah. If you've never been there, it's, it's really amazing. And where is it? It's like in Tennessee or something? Yeah, it's in Memphis. Memphis. And they they actually uh, they have a golf tournament they do there every year on the PGA Tour, right? Which I I played in a couple times. Yeah, you mentioned Riviera uh, Country Club. Um, this is the the club that you grew up going to. Yeah, my dad joined Riviera in 1956. Right. So I've been playing golf ever since. Um, eight, that's when I was eight years old or ten years old, and. Um, Riviera is like the best golf course in Southern California, and uh, you know they've had the PGA tournament there, and and they, every year they have their own you know PGA tournament. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty cool place. Yeah, we have so there are some golf stories in the book. I know to non-golfers that sounds maybe not interesting, but I will say you do have some interesting golf stories. You'll hear about. Robbie Krieger playing golf with O.J. Simpson uh, back in the day. So, uh, you know, for, and then anyone who's into golf, you'll get some some good uh, tales of on, from the course. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I guess so. I just have a couple more here. Uh, and in the book, you talk about sort of, you know, you, you've lived a great life. You feel very fortunate uh, to be in the position you're in. Um, and you just had sort of a few things maybe left on a very short bucket list here. So a round at Augusta, uh, a collaboration with Bob Dylan, a trip to India. And I want to know how close are we getting here? Are we going to get, it seems like these are achievable goals for, for you. Is, can we get you a round at Augusta? Is that happening? Uh, you know, I just talked to a guy the other day that says he, he can do it. I played in a golf tournament uh, over here at Lakeside Country Club. It was George Lopez's tournament, mm -hmm. and uh, I think uh, I played with uh, with um, Joe uh, Joe Pesci, Joe right? Pesci. Yeah. How was that? What was that how was, was it cool? Like? He's yeah. so good. He's so cool. He's like I, I I played with him before. Did he stab anyone with a pen mm -hmm. while you were no? No, but but Golf he pencil? was talking about the that in the movie where he he says to the guy. 
oh, I'm funny? You think I'm funny? Yeah, yeah. He said that really happened. That was his idea, and that, and he told the uh, the director about it. And I yeah. said, all right, let's do it. There you go. So that someone said that to Joe Pesci, and no, he, was, he said it. Yeah, somebody said it to him in real life. In real life, and, he and this guy in. was really scary. He said, and it was uh, that was pretty cool. That's great. There you go. Some Goodfellas yeah. trivia while we're at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The uh, so yes, okay. So you're working on Augusta. We'll get there. What about yeah. Bob Dylan? Has any have you ever reached out, or is there mm. someone's got to have his phone number? I, I mean, I met him, you know, at the Hall of Fame, but I didn't have the mm -hmm. the nerve to uh, ask him. Uh, you're still but, being very '60s cool. You couldn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know. I mean, today, I don't think it would. Uh, maybe it wouldn't work. You know, he's one way to find out. Yeah, different direction. Sure. But, Bob, if you're in the mood, uh, love to hook up. Put the word out. It's, uh, just see what happens, you know? Yeah. What's, what's the harm? And a uh, trip to India, I don't know, that's maybe not this year. We're not <laughs> going to go to India. <laughs> but you know what we got to do? we got to translate the book into Hindi, and then you and I will go. We'll do a, a book tour over there and do interviews. There you go. There's a billion people there. Some of them have to be Doors fans, right? Have you ever met any Doors fans from India? Oh, uh, that's a good question. A few. A few. Um, you know, although they, I think they grew up here, but, uh, and I did I did get to hang out with Robbie Shankar one day down at a uh, studio in Santa Monica, and, and I told him about the end and how I used you know the uh, Indian scales and that. How did he react? Did he know the song? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he but he liked the idea. He was cool with it. All right. So yeah, just I guess we'll wrap this up. Uh, I just have one last question, very important one. Uh, something I've heard uh, put forth, a proposition I've heard put forth, and I just wanted to officially get you to weigh in. So Robbie Krieger, can you petition the Lord with prayer? <laughs> you can. You definitely can. Oh, you can. You can yes, petition the Lord can, with prayer. But it might not work. Yeah, of course. That's, but, that's the problem. Okay, that's a good you way know, to look you, at it. You, you never can. know if he's listening or not. Okay, you can petition him. You're not going to get a response. Yeah. That's a refreshing, re refreshingly balanced take on that. <laughs> I don't know why Jim said that even. Uh, I think he, uh, was he anti-religion? I, I think he might have been. Maybe it's the, uh, yeah, you tell me. I mean, yeah, I mean when I, I took him to see Maharishi, Mm -hmm. time and and uh, Maharishi was doing you know doing his thing and this is Maharishi who taught you how to meditate and right yeah yeah Maharishi Mahesh Yogi mm -hmm. and uh, you know John and I were both into the meditation in fact that's where we met Ray was at a meditation meeting uh, back in 64 I think it was right and uh, so Jim says, "Come on, I want to. I want to meet him. I want to get up close after after it was over. There's all these people, you know, trying to talk to Maharishi. So we waited around, waited around, and, and finally we got got close to him. And I, I said, Maharishi, this is Jim Morrison. He's our singer, and blah blah blah. And uh, and so you know, Jim didn't spit on him or anything. And it was he was, was cool." But then after after we left and we were going out, I said, "Well, what did you think? What did you think?" He says, "Didn't see nothing there. Didn't feel nothing." So I don't know. Either he's uh, anti-religion, or maybe he just didn't want to want to admit that he, you know, maybe that he felt something. It was pretty hard not to feel something when when you talk to Maharishi. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. This is uh, really great. Every I hope everybody picks up the book. Again, there's a million more stories that we we didn't get to, um, but it's all in there. And uh, yeah, thank you for and thank you for letting me. I'll publicly thank you for letting me work on it with you. It was really know, quite an experience. You, uh, wouldn't have happened without you. Believe right. me. This guy really. He was the uh, push I needed to get this, uh, get this done. It's a privilege to push you, Robbie Krieger. So, mm -hmm. yes, thank you. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Robbie and Jeff. Again, Robbie Krieger's book is Set the Night on Fire, Living, Dying, and Playing Guitar with the Doors, and is available wherever books are sold. Signed copies are available in the link below. Thanks, and go on gently. <laughs>